In this video, we look at the details of how the UDP transport protocol works. Let's get started. Now let's see how UDP works. As we've been mentioning, UDP is a no-frills protocol. It provides the multiplexing and demultiplexing that's needed from the transport layer, and that's about it. Because it's not trying to provide these other connection-oriented services, it doesn't need control messages, which keeps it dramatically simpler than TCP. So why would we want a transport protocol without any reliability? Well, for one thing, it's fast. We don't have to wait for a connection to be established before we can transfer data. It's low overhead, so clients and servers can handle many, many connections simultaneously. It's efficient in terms of keeping the header size small, and it won't be forced to slow down by connection, which can be a positive or negative depending on the context. So UDP is suitable for things like multimedia streaming, which tend to be loss tolerant, DNS, which sends very small messages and is sensitive to delay, SNMP, the Simple Network Management Protocol, which is another fast transactional protocol, and most recently, HTTP3. Now, as we've seen before, HTTP needs reliability, but with version 3, it's implementing its own reliability on top of UDP in order to go faster than it could over TCP. The UDP protocol is specified in RFC 768, which includes all the technical details necessary for an operating system developer to implement the UDP protocol. Here's an example using the SNMP protocol to send messages over UDP. On the center side, UDP receives a message from the application. It adds the UDP header fields, combines that all into a segment, which it passes to the network layer, and allows IP to do its job, creating a packet and sending it over the network. Then on the receiver side, the IP layer removes its header and passes the message up to the UDP layer. UDP receives the segment from IP and checks the checksum to make sure that the message hasn't gotten corrupted along the way. If the checks pass, then it extracts the application message and delivers it to the correct socket. The UDP segment header is quite simple with only four fields. The source and destination port are used for multiplexing and demultiplexing, as we've talked about in the previous video. Then it specifies the length of the entire segment, header included. It has the checksum, and it has the payload, which is the message from the application. Next, we're going to talk a little more about the checksum and how that works. So networks at various points can introduce errors, meaning some bits can be changed as they're transported through the network, and so they're incorrect on arrival. So the goal of the checksum is to find out if this happened. A very simple way to do this is to add up all the values sent and to send along the sum with the original values. Then if one of the values changes in transit, we'll know that the numbers don't add up. The receiver can compute the checksum and can see that it's not the same as the sum that it received from the sender. Note that the receiver has no way to tell which number changed. It could be either the first number or the second number or the checksum itself. So all the receiver can do is say this data is bad and throw it out. UDP does this by treating all of the values of the header and the payload as a series of 16-bit integers and adding them up using one's complement arithmetic and it's put into the 16-bit UDP checksum field. The receiver performs the same computation and checks to see if it matches what it received in the checksum field. If the values don't match, then it detects an error. And again, it won't know if that error is in the header or the message or the checksum field itself it just knows that there's an error. Also note that it's possible for errors to be introduced that can fool this type of checksum such that the checksum is still correct even though errors are present. We'll see more on that later. Here's an example of computing a ones complement checksum, starting with performing standard binary arithmetic of these two integers. Note that the sum of these two integers is 17 bits, but we only have a 16-bit checksum field. So we take the carryout and wrap it around back to the low order bits of the sum. Once we've added that and performed the necessary carries, we now have our 16-bit sum. The check sum is the inverse of this sum, meaning all the bits are flipped. And that's it. That's the value that would be stored in the header. Now we'll see why this method provides only weak protection for the contents of the message. We're going to say that in transit, two bits got flipped. These are the two low order bits of the first integer. But perversely, another two bits got flipped as well the two low order bits of the second integer. These four bit flips cancel each other out, and so the math all works out exactly the same, and so on the receiver side, the checksum will look valid. 
there's no change in the checksum. So internet checksums are considered quite weak and not a reliable means of protecting data. For high confidence, applications need to perform a more complex method of data validation, such as computing a CRC. So a quick summary of UDP. It's a no frills protocol. It provides the multiplexing and demultiplexing that's needed to get messages to the correct sockets. And it has the benefits of low complexity and high efficiency, which are valuable to certain applications. Applications that don't get the performance desired from TCP can implement the other reliability and congestion control functionality on top of UDP. That wraps up our discussion of UDP. In the next video, we'll start looking at principles of reliable data transfer. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.